And all God's people together can say, amen. Be seated if you are able. We are in a series all about adding to the family. So if you want to go back and watch, uh, do a recap on YouTube, you can. Um, it's hilarious. The first week I set up a playpen, which was somewhat disastrous. And then um, I had to get help. And then last week we had a little toddler slide. And we're talking about how in even part of a church, we have new people and that newness of coming to church lasts about six weeks, but we have to make sure as a church that have been part of a wake church or part of a congregation for a while that we keep in touch with them. We keep them, you know, happy, make sure that they're doing well and, and getting what they need. And then as um, the infant turns into a toddler and into a preschool age, you still can't leave them alone. There's still supervision required. And then after those preschool years, you get into this age, and it lasts a lot longer. And I think for church people, this, this phase lasts a lot longer. And that's kind of like that six years to like 13, 14 years old, where it's kind of this middle ground where you have to start learning responsibility as a child. And um, so I was talking with David, and I had this idea about what I should bring up here on stage to represent, like, learning responsibility, whether it's um, starting out by teaching your five- or six-year-old how to fold hand towels, which is fine, you just let them do it, or feeding the pets, or um, taking out the trash when they get a little bit stronger, or emptying the dishwasher at 10 years old. Like, there's, there's progression in things. And so um, you might still be stuck in those baby phases of your own at home, and you're like, oh, will this kid ever start to participate in something besides making it worse? Yes and no. Yes and no. We're always working on it. So we're talking about, like, responsibility. We want to have ownership. They still need supervision. And so David said, well, this is what you should probably bring out. <laughs> right? It's that age where you have to learn how to take care of yourself, but you're not going to be really, really good at it. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to go into details about my family, but I have a, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 17, almost 18-year-old, and then a 20-year-old and a 22-year-old. So I've got a wide range. And so we're right now in that, like, 10 to, you know, 18-year-old, he kind of, almost 18-year-old, he kind of takes care of himself. That was him up here singing today. Um, so, you know, senior year and all that. So he's almost taking care of himself. I still want texts, like, where are you going or when are you going to be back home? So just don't, don't worry. But that's kind of normal for any parents, right? Except my parents. They had too many kids to worry about. They're like, eh, she'll be all right. She's the oldest. She's responsible. Uh, but normally for most kids, like, you have to work with them for a long period of time in order to train them uh, to be part of the family and be able to give back to society, if you don't, then you have just spoiled kids that grow up really entitled and they think less of themselves, actually. And you think that they would feel more valuable because somebody's taking care of them, like, uh, you know, like a prince or a princess just should be taken care of. But they actually feel less of themselves. Um, one of my things that I say to my kids, and they're going to love that you're inside on this, so please don't ever tell them. I say, how are you going to contribute to the family today? And I let them choose, like, what are you going to do? Or when I come back from a long day at work, I said, how have you contributed to the family today? And, and you know, answers can vary from anything like, uh, I don't know, I didn't make a bigger mess than was already here. You know, to productive things, like I made a huge mess with all the Lego sets in the basement. Right? So, uh, but, you know, how did you contribute to the family? When they're itty-bitty babies, you don't expect anything but, like, Please sleep, please sleep, please sleep. But older, the only contribution you want is obedience. But when they get to that middle school years, you want actual contribution, and then they can start emptying the dishwasher, and guess what you get to do? You get to wipe off the kitchen table and the kitchen counters and start sweeping. You're actually showing teamwork and togetherness. It's not you go and start working. You find a new person in the church, and they're just passionate about nursing home. This is it was so joyful yesterday. I, like, whatever oppression was in there is gone, and I'm not going to say anything else about that, but just felt like it was, it was good. Like, we walked in, I was like, this is fun. Like, we had laughter and joy. And uh, anyway, it was a totally different experience than the past. Um, 
but I don't, if somebody says, I'm passionate about nursing home, and, and I'm like, okay, go and be blessed. No, I actually have to go with them. And when they're doing nursing home, then I'm like, all right, well, while you're doing that, I have this other opportunity. I am going to come and play piano so that you can sing for the nursing home. Or if a new person says, hey, I would really like to start up like this men's group where once a month the men get together, I'd be like, okay, go ahead. No, because you're doing men's group ministry for us, that means that I can put more men into it and you guys can start taking care of each other. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That does not just apply to little kids getting older. That also applies to... Um, people in the church who are new to the church, finding a place to fit in. And this time can uh, last, this time of finding a place to fit in can last anywhere from like uh, six months up to like maybe uh, two years. And in those two years, we figure out a lot of things about each other. But the big thing is, is not getting discouraged when they forget to put on the deodorant or when they're doing things that you still don't like, and it's because you don't really understand all of their quirks. This is a time of uh, season and a new person coming to your church that, that you might start seeing some of their dirty laundry, right? Proverbial dirty laundry, but in a middle school, it's like literal dirty laundry. Whose socks are these, right? So you start seeing their dirty laundry, and will you stick with it long enough for them to become integrated uh, part of this church? We don't call it membership, we call it partnership, but part of the family. So I'm going through this book, um, and Dr. Coleman, he's an old, old guy now. He's probably in his 80s. He's talking about when he was a young guy in ministry. Um, he's saying, why must a mature Christian love people? And, this is funny, how do you love someone you might not like? Okay, all right. Uh, I think of a man I was, who was equally hard to like. This is the second example. When I was a pastor, he was an old horse trader, trader, like he trades horses. So let's date that when it needs to be dated. Who lived just a mile from the church. He had five or six kids and his house was dilapidated. Dilapidated? I felt sorry for his wife. Okay. Wow, for a pastor, that's saying something, right? When you feel sorry for the whole family, like that's saying something. I visited everybody in the community in those days, saint or sinner, it didn't matter to me. The first time I visited him, he told me he didn't have time for church. When I visited him again, he said, well, preacher, I can't come to church because I don't know how to act and my kids don't know how to act. Well, that's no problem, sir, I said. I'm used to any situation. I've preached out on the street. I can tolerate, for me, I have preached in the nursing home. I can tolerate any kind of distraction. You bring those kids, they won't bother me. He took me up on it. Gulp. He came to church, and it was just like he said. Those kids were wild. They were hollering and screaming. I just kept on preaching. One of the members of the church came up to me, red in the face, and said, Pastor, I don't know if I can stand it anymore. But that man and his family came back again and again, and the man got saved. I mean, he got saved. He cleaned up his house, he cleaned up those kids, and he and his family came to church all the time. You have to love people until you can like them. You have to love people. Like when they're little and they're new and everything's fun, like when you're first dating somebody, like, ooh, this is fun, and then stuff starts bubbling up to the surface, and you're like, I'm not sure about this. But if it's the person after you're married, like maybe they held it together for the two years that you're engaged and, and now every, you get married and you're like, oh, what did I get into? Sometimes you have to keep loving until you can like them again. The key is looking at people with the eyes of Jesus because Jesus loves them. And that's what I want in my life. The more I can get that kind of love, the better I am, the better we all are. In the church family, we have stunted our growth sometimes by going to extremes with new people. Once we start to get to know them, we either ignore them and hope somebody else is going to take care of them when stuff starts bubbling up, or we try to control them and fix everything about them and their lives. But what they need is something in the middle of, did you remember to put on your deodorant? where it's a partnership and a relationship. It's, uh, it's not mentoring and it's not coaching because you're on equal terms. 
yeah, I'm still, I might be further ahead in this, but I'm still on the same journey to Jesus that you are. And one day you're going to be able to pay it back to me. I know it. Um, I have been in relationships with people that if you just stick with it and you put up healthy boundaries, at some point that relationship starts benefiting you. Sometimes it doesn't ever benefit you and you have to rely on other people. Like that codependent thing, that's a little bit weird, right? Don't do that. But what I'm saying is you can't control them. You can't ignore them. We bring people into a relationship. And I'm talking about like mature people. Now, mature people, you might still feel like you're in the middle school years, but you've been here, part of this church, for longer than maybe like a year or two. You kind of have things figured out. I kind of treat you like family. You know, I forget to show you where the fridge is and tell you to help yourself because you already know to help yourself, right? That's where we are in our, my relationship with most of you here. But some of you might still feel like you need somebody to walk alongside you. And that's okay. It means that you're still learning. We're going to stay in Hebrews today. So turn with me first to Hebrews chapter 5. Now, I didn't realize how much about relationship that Hebrews is. Um, and we're not really sure who wrote Hebrews while you're turning to chapter 5. I'll have some of the words up on the screen too. What the author here is saying that we have to talk to you as, as children because you are not yet ready for the heavier things, right? Oh, no, I'm not, I, said, I told Jesus, like, I'm not going to judge any parents harshly for giving their six-month-old french fries. That's kind of my pet peeve, right? I mean, french fries are delicious, I have to say, but I don't know. It's like solid food, that's good, but, but according to, like, the books, you're supposed to wait till, like, nine months to give them, like, oatmeal or rice or something. I, I don't know. I'm out of it now. All right. So now that you're there, um, I'm going to start in 12, but then up on the screen we'll go verse 14. You have been believers so long now, now you know if God's talking about you or not, all right? If this isn't about you, just let it roll off. If it is for you, let it hit home. You have been believers so long now, you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. All right, so leave that up for a minute. All right, solid food, and he's talking about things of God that are beyond the basic teachings, and we'll talk about basic teachings here in a second. Solid food, those are for mature people who what? Have got the training you know to brush your teeth twice a day and to put on your deodorant once a day and to shower a couple, at least a few times a week, if not daily. You know as a grown-up how to call the doctor and schedule your annual checkups. Do it if you haven't done it already. You know that you should stop eating after 10 o'clock at night if you're going to bed soon or 9 o'clock at night if you're going to bed soon because you're a grown-up. You know that it's not good for you to be drinking like six or seven Red Bulls in a day because you're now a grown-up or three to four Monster drinks because you're a grown-up. You want to make good choices. But some, this author is saying, are not there yet. They still need the training and they still need the teaching. But who's going to teach them about the spiritual things? Who's going to teach them about? So now um, you know that as a mature Christian, let's go to mature Christian instead of just kids. Sorry, kids, I keep picking on you. We're going to move to like the wheelchairs and walkers in a later series, and then we can pick on the grown-up, big, the old people, right? Really old. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm getting up there. My birthday is in like a week and a half, so I'm, no, I'm not feeling it yet. All right. Sorry. Where was I? Okay, so let's talk about spiritual. We talked about kids. Now let's talk about spiritual kids the basics of things. You know, as a follower, to read your Bible every day. You know that you have a direct access to Jesus through the Holy Spirit every day. You should be praying. You know that you can go around and pray for people. Hebrews 5, um, oh, Hebrews uh, 6 goes on, but before we do that, I want you to turn to your neighbor, and in one sentence, I want you to think of either a spiritual life skill or a physical life skill that you think kids today still need. So, and maybe you're thinking of yourself still as a child in the faith or a child in the world. What life skill do you think that you need? What is important for people? And then I'll ask the crowd. 
Go, so take one minute, turn to the person sitting next to you, because remember, we don't sit on our own anymore. Daniel, you'll have to go sit over here by David. I know, so you can talk to him. Look, there you go. <laughs> All right. Oh, Sarah's on her own. Sarah, you have to scooch over by Ann. Sorry. All right, so what are the solid food teachings or life skills you think kids today need? I think. All right, back here in the corner, what did you guys come up with? Since I picked on you, David and Samuel. You didn't pick up on any life skills? Yeah. What life skills, though? Specifically. Money, yeah. That came up here, too. Money management, right? That's good. Uh, any other things? Yeah, Gwen. Self-discipline. Yeah. Accepting responsibility. Right. Like, you put on your deodorant. You're gonna, like, by the time they're, like, 13, 14 years old, I don't have to say anything about that anymore. Like, I really not. Oh my goodness, I was at, um, Ben Medley was there too, we were at the park with the boys, and these disc, these two seventh grade boys were coming by with their frisbees, their discs, and they're walking around, they're looking, like, what are you guys looking for? He goes, I lost a disc, I said, okay, and my deodorant. I'm like, well, we saw your deodorant floating in the creek, not kidding. And he kind of looked at it in the muddy creek for a minute, he's like, oh, I'll be all right. I said, do you have deodorant at home? Like, are you sure you're okay? Because, I mean, like, I'm going to make sure that we can get that deodorant out of the creek if you don't have any at home. He goes, no, I'm okay. I said, are you sure? Like, I, I want to be nice to his mom, right? <laughs> like, do you have something at home? So these are life skills. And that wasn't a lot of time, but hopefully it's making you think that there are things still that Christians don't always have the life skills for or the spiritual life skills for. And when we're in a relationship with people, and I've talked about this before, clarity is kindness. Clarity is kindness. Now, the reason we put on deodorant, and maybe you're into natural deodorants, I think that's great, or maybe you just, you know, walk around like this all the time so you don't get sweaty. But um, you have these life skills that the reason that you want to do this is not just so you can match everybody else, it's so that when you get around and people and you've been playing games or you've been working, whatever, that you don't start smelling up the whole house, right? The whole room. I've had that happen where I'm like, who's been working out in here without deodorant? So clarity is kindness, though. We're not, we're not trying to hurt people's feelings by saying like, hey, we don't, we don't really want to swear in church or we want to make sure that we level up our filter level. I was at a, the... Um, uh, uh, courts over here for pickleball courts and uh, a couple of guys were swearing and I had my little kids there and I was like do I say anything do I just try to be Jesus and I was like no clarity is kindness because my kids I'm going to pull them off the courts and get them home and I was like no hey guys can you clean it up and then I heard it again hey guys my kids are here oh sorry instead of being all cranky with them and trying to be nice I was just kind but clarifying what these life skills are, what the spiritual skills are. It's one of the reasons why we're offering on the August 25th, right after church, this um, partners class. What, is our, what are our values of the church? And if you don't know if you've attended before, um, then uh, let me know and I'll um, give you like the list and say yes or no. It was back in 2022. So we have these classes, we have these opportunities to learn about each other and learn about what our values are. Um, one last story. I have, I'm full of stories today. So uh, there was a couple that came to our church um, back when David and I first started coming, and I felt like they were trying to control the direction of the church, trying to control things. They were bossy. I was still new, so I was trying to figure out like how to set boundaries and still allow people to lead in their strengths. Finally, after a couple of months, we had to have a come to Jesus meeting at Panera. And we're having to come, now their prices are so high, I can't go there anymore. But we, um, it's ridiculous, we just eat at home. Um, did you make good sandwiches with that bread yet? Okay, good. All right, so, um, sorry, my brain. Got a little ADD, that's great. So I'm having to come to Jesus with this family, and we're not seeing eye to eye on anything, anything. And I'm just like so frustrated. And so we're sitting there, and within 20 minutes, 
I say, well, see, we're part of the church of God. And she said, yes, church of God. I said, right. And she said, Cleveland, Tennessee? And I said, no, Anderson, Indiana. Go look it up sometime if you want to. I was like, oh, we were speaking different languages. It's not that we had a smell problem. It wasn't that something was wrong, as they thought that the vision for our church because of what we believed was this way, and it's actually more like this way. You go long enough, just a couple of degrees difference, I mean, you're still probably going to get to heaven, but how you do church and life together is going to look much, much different, possibly. All right, so clarity is kindness. That's why even um, yesterday I had an opportunity to do some really cool things, ask me about it later. Um, I'm talking to this lady, and she goes, it would have been really neat if the motorcycles had done this. And I said, are you with the people with the motorcycles? She goes, yeah, that's why I said that. I said, oh, okay. She goes, I know you from last, I said, okay. But I just, I just wanna make sure that everything we say is clear. Even if I feel like I'm repeating myself, even if I feel like people should already know everything, but I need to teach everybody as if they don't know everything. So here are some basics that we have been covering for the past few years that I've been here. Um, some of this we've talked about more so lately, and some of it we kind of talked about a while back, but we're still going to talk about it in the future. And these are the basic teachings um, that Hebrews 6 talks about, and here they are. Repentance, faith in God, baptism, that's, we actually dunk adults, we don't sprinkle kids, even though I see why other uh, denominations do that. Um, laying on of hands, we talked about that last week, it's just praying for people by, you know, laying hands on their shoulders if they're comfortable with that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, resurrection of the dead, hallelujah, Jesus rose from the dead, at one point we will also join him. Um, and eternal judgment. We know at the end of this life, we will all stand before the throne. These are our basic teachings of the church. Now, we also have some extra things that are coming up, extra teachings. Now, these extra teachings are going to be things like, um, uh, extra teachings are, um, oh, here it is, Melchizedek and the importance of tithing right? Oh, man, we don't even know who that is, and yet he's, you know, here in Hebrews. Or talking about um, Jesus as a high priest, like why do we need a high priest if sacrifice is over? These are extra teachings, not extra biblical, but extra for mature people or, or people who have studied the Bible enough to know that there's deeper things about this than just laying on of hands and getting saved, that there's more to life than just getting through the day knowing that your soul is saved. So these are the basic teachings. And, and then um, the Revelation class, so we're going to start on September 18th. We're going to read Revelation a little bit different than maybe how you read it growing up, how different than how I read it growing up. And we're going to read through Revelation as, as hopefully as it was intended back then, or at least another perspective on many perspectives. But these Revelation series, I'm not going to do it on a Sunday morning this way because I feel like we need conversation. We need discussion. We need people that are new to the faith and those experiencing the faith to struggle with a book that's supposed to bring hope and joy and life and yet confuses and scares people sometimes. Um, turn to Hebrews 10. So how do we do this? How do we walk in relationship with people that need training over and over and over again? Or you're like, will they ever get out of this middle school phase? Will they ever remember to put on deodorant? Will they ever remember that... It, like whatever, to, to pray before they worry? Will they ever remember to brush their teeth? Will they ever remember to invite a friend to church? Like there's these are all these basic things on and on and on. But um, Hebrews 10, 32 says, this is how we deal with it. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Think back on when you were struggling, when you were new when things were new and fresh and you didn't have all the answers and you were okay with that, but you were just so excited about learning. Remember how you remained faithful even though you, it meant terrible suffering. You know, people today stepping into the Christian faith, like you might be comfortable because you have your circle of Christian friends and you have the safety of a Christian church, but those who are going to be new to the faith are gonna to have to come from a place where their friends are not necessarily Christians or will necessarily accept them as a Christian or they'll be weird about it because Christianity on a whole does not have a really um, 
high regard in a lot of people's minds right now for you know the damage that's been done to the name of Christ. I mean, God's purifying his church, so I'm glad some of this stuff's bubbling up, but man, it looks all of us who claim to be Christians look a little bit bad. And you have to prove through your good deeds and your works and the basic teachings that you are going to persevere. But those who are new to the faith, those who are new to this, they're going to want somebody to walk alongside them, to partner with them and say, hey, I remember what it was like to tell my family that I was a Christian. I remember what it was like when I told my family I was no longer going to go to those kind of movies with them. I remember what I, I don't know how it was, but I remember what it was like to tell my my buddies that I wasn't going to be able to go to the bar. I can go bowling, but I can't order any beers. Like, I remember those days. And sometimes as Christians, we become so, like, self-righteous in ourselves, and we think so much of ourselves because I don't do those things anymore. And it hurts your Christian testimony. It hurts your witness to these new people that are coming into the church that just want to learn Jesus. They want to learn about Jesus. They want to meet him face to face and and the one who can take away all their sins and give them hope and purpose and direction. So I, I hope and I pray, church, that even as you are growing in the faith, that you will continue to affirm your values for these safe connections, to, to allow people to be safe because you're all, like, understanding. Like, who was I talking to earlier? And they said, well, it was probably Jen. You said, I, you know, I vote different than this lady. Can we still be friends? Yeah, as long as clarity is kindness, right? I vote different than some of you. Like, it's clarity is kindness, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we can't still learn and grow and be disciples of Jesus together. It also means that we can't judge people who are not there yet. That's why I love this beautiful mess of a church, because we do genuinely love each other. And where we have disagreements and things, like we're still part of the body of Christ. There was a, oh, I do have one more story. It's 1130. We're okay. We're okay. Um, uh, part of, part of uh, Lydia's school orientation for classes that she was in, Christian uh, homeschool thing um the woman said we're all part of the body of christ but sometimes the nose and the armpit don't go together i thought that was ridiculous because what the nose needs to tell the armpit is like hey you need to take a shower and what the armpit needs to tell the nose is like i'm here for a reason like there's a reason that i belong to this body she was saying stay away from people that you don't like i'm saying reconcile with people that you don't understand even if you don't see eye to eye, I have family members that we're like, Whoa. we're still like, what's our common ground? What, how can we affirm our values that we agree on? And those will be our basic teachings. Those are the basic things in order to train each other up and learn from each other and grow. Hebrews 10, 37, for in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith but I take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Jesus is going to return one day. And even if it's not now, even if Jesus returns in a thousand years from now, one day we will meet him in the sky. One day we will stand before him and have to give an account. Uh, you know, I'm probably going to go before my youngest brother goes, right? So my rapture, my, my going to Jesus is going to be a lot sooner than his. And that's what we're teaching people. We're coming alongside them and we're training them. We're saying, hey, let's work together. Let's figure this out. Um, I think I need some background music. It sets the mood for prayer. Yeah, I know. You all want to have tracks when you have to close a deal at, church, or at work, right? You're like, I need to close this deal, so I'm going to like turn up the music a little bit. Now, the reason I do that is because God wants to speak to your heart right now. And maybe there's a, a family member or there's something in your life, and you have been just kind of avoiding it because you're like, I don't, I don't even want to mess with this anymore. It's too much work. I don't know about this middle school age. It's really uncomfortable. They're not contributing much to me. I just feel like it's a big burden. But we know that God puts us in relationships that teach us and refine our character and help us to be the people that also cry out to Jesus on our knees when things are not going well. And so that's what I hope for you. Think about that person that, that you've been in relationship with, that God has partnered you with. And it might even be like your kids. 
that you are discipling and you're mentoring and you've got to stick with them even if you're ready to just set them free. When are you leaving for college, right? No, God says, I, I need you to be in relationship for a lot longer than you think you have to because I'm using you to make disciples who make disciples who share the love and the message of Jesus Christ to everyone. So adding to the family is a little bit messy. It's sometimes complicated. We don't always have to play nice, but we do have to be clear with each other, be kind, and, and allow the basic teachings to be basic, and allow the, the people that are ready for harder things to participate in harder things. All right, um, so, so I'm going to pray broadly for all of you for that, for, for the relationships in your life that you need to work on, not to ignore and not to control, but just to walk alongside um, but is there anyone that needs just like a little extra prayer today? There's a little something extra going on, and you and God knows what it, know what it is, knows what it is. All right, let's go ahead and raise your hand if there's something, if there's something extra. Yep. All right. Heavenly Father, on behalf of my brothers and sisters in Christ here, I just humbly come to you, and I just pray that you would clarify the next step for each of the, those that are just dealing with heavy burdens or even dealing with relationships that they're just trying to figure out boundaries for. God, I just pray that there would be clarity, even if there's not clarity over the next like three months, that at least this week there would be clarity and next steps. God, you use um, hard relationships to purify us and to cleanse us. And so sometimes that's really difficult for us. But help us not to give up. Help us to persevere. And those who are mature in you, I just pray that they would walk alongside those that are young in the faith or even new to this church, that we would not give up on each other so that we can be the body that you designed, the body of Christ that you've designed Awake Church to be. We thank you, God, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have a